Happy New Year's. I'm not sure if people are happier to see 2020 go or to see a brand new year in. The, the video we just watched reminds us that God is still in control. We still have hope. Hope not just that a vaccine's gonna solve everything. Hope not in government or business renewal, as important as those things are. Hope not in things getting back to normal, whatever normal might mean, but hope in God. Hope that is real and, and, and not wishful thinking. Hope that's rooted in the person of Jesus Christ and not simply in our ideas and our plans. Hope and trust that the promises of God are still true. He is still with us. He is still at work. And so join me as we enter into worship today. People of the world, it's time to celebrate new beginnings and we step into the new year with faith. People of faith, it's time to look ahead in hope. We step into the unknown with hope. People of hope, it's time to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, and we step forward together as God's family. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will be glad and rejoice in it. This is the year that the Lord has begun. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is good to those who hope is in him, to those who seek him. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. As you are aware, we're back to meeting online only for the next few weeks. But let's not lose sight of the fact that we can still connect. OCC kids are meeting via Zoom on Sunday mornings at 9.30. Uh, we're meeting at uh, Sunday evenings at 6.30 to gather to prayer via Zoom. Our life groups are going to be starting up again. Connect with others. Give someone a call. Send a text or an email. Write a card. Uh, check out the, um, the, the slides at the end of this video for ways to connect. Over the next few weeks, uh, we're going to be in the short letter that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. Uh, Pastor Brent's going to kick us off today as we, as we look forward. And I think it's an important, an appropriate book for us to explore at the beginning of 2021. Paul was no stranger to emotional stress. Giving his life away for gospel ministry landed him in prison. And yet one of the key words in this letter, in this book, is the noun joy and the verb rejoice. It's a letter written when Paul was in prison but it's also a letter that's full of joy. It's a letter that's full of encouragement when things aren't going according to plan. And so in a time of increasing COVID-19 numbers, in a time of disappointment, in a time of feeling discouraged or frustrated, 
In a time when it's so easy to become anxious or slip into depression, let's allow the words of Philippians to encourage, to strengthen, to challenge us to be all that God is working in this time. Judy and Stan, Ray and Brenda and Aaron are going to lead us now in, in, in worship. When we're online, we can sing, so I invite you to enter in. And after that, Pastor Brent is going to uh, come and bring the message. Good morning, and thank you for being with us this morning to worship. We've just come off of a different Christmas and New Year's season, and I think we've all experienced uh, what we're going to sing about in this song, and that's having everything stripped away from us that we're so used to. All the gatherings we've been used to, all the um, uh, going out and being with people, being physically with people, that has all kind of fallen away. But I don't know about you, I've found that because of all those things have been taken away and all that has been left is Jesus, we've been able to worship him more purely and more completely. And I, I hope that's true for you. Um, and if it isn't, we, we ask that you would just ask him to make himself real to you and to, um, to be very present in whatever it is that you're, you're going through right now.
When we go through winter, winter is fine. Some of us love it, some of us hate it, but something happens by like late February or early March when you've had a really bad winter. Now it's obviously too early to kind of tell what kind of winter is in store for us. I'm trying to offer you some hope today. Usually by late February or early March, there's this day of spring. You know what I'm talking about? It's sort of almost like a, a fluke. This day comes and it's like plus five or plus 10 and suddenly everyone changes. Everyone gets happier. People start wearing shorts, even though they shouldn't be. You know what I'm talking about? And I think the reason is simple. It gives hope. And so we're in the middle of winter and then suddenly we get a day of spring. It reminds us that winter is not the end. Even we who love winter every once in a while need the out in days like this. They suddenly begin to remind us that spring is coming and after spring there's this amazing season called summer that so many of us long for. And as I was reflecting on weather, I was reflecting on winter and spring and summer and, and that analogy stuck with me as we prepared today's message. Today we're, we're looking at Philippians chapter 3 and we're in the second half starting in verse 10. The story in the book of Philippians is one of joy and suffering. It's a story of hope. It's a story of deep sacrifice. It's a story of transformation. It's actually a story of the unnatural breaking into the natural. And the reason why I brought it to spring is this story that Paul is painting. He's speaking into the life of that congregation and he's speaking into, the, into us as well. It's like spring where the deadness of winter is slowly changing, slowly ebbing away, where life once had been and then seemed removed for a period. It's coming back. 
This story is the story of where spring will grow and strengthen and finish in summer, a summer that has not yet come, and it's coming soon. Now for Paul, our winter spiritually is living without the Son of God, living without Jesus. And, G and spring is that time when we meet him for the first time and we begin to grow in him. Actually, spring for the Christian is our existence right now. And then summer is when he will come back, when he will break back into full creation and make all of creation seen and unseen what it was supposed to be. This is the center of what Paul begins to speak into the Philippian church and into us today. Paul's summary of what the Christian life looks like as we live in spring begins in Philippians 3.10. He says, I want to know Christ. Yes, I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to participate in his sufferings, um, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. This is the resume of every Christian on earth. This is the heartbeat of a normal Christian life. This is the mission statement of every Christian on earth, no matter who you are or where they've come from. And so here's a question as we begin our time of study today. Is this you? Does this description summarize your Christian walk? This is not meant for super Christians who sit in first class with Jesus. This is for all of us. Paul knew Jesus more than any of us, and yet he continues to say, I want to know Christ more. I want to walk in the power of re his resurrection. He says, I will willingly participate in Jesus' suffering. He says, I want to die a death like Jesus. In other words, others-centered, and I want to have the resurrection of the dead. And this is the grand summary of the normal Christian life. This desire that he describes, this experience, this call, shows why so many around us shake their heads at disbelief in the Christian faith. They sit with us and yet they do not believe. And it was the famed preacher, A.W. Tozer, who got it this way when he said, a real Christian is odd in so many ways. He feels supreme love for someone who he's never met. He talks familiarly every day to someone he cannot see. He expects to go to heaven on the virtue of another person. He empties himself in order to be full, admits he wrongs so he can be declared right. He goes down in order to get up. He's strongest when he's weakest. He's richest when he's poorest. He's happiest when he feels worst. He dies so he can live. He forsakes in order to have. He gives away so he can keep. He sees the invisible. He hears the inaudible. And he knows which passes supposed knowledge. And the world says, you're all crazy. And we say, yes, of course. I want to know Christ. I want to know his resurrection. I am willingly going to lay down what I think I have the right to do in this life because I want to participate in sufferings. Now, when we read that amazing statement by Paul, we, ne we need to stop very quickly because instead of seeing it for what it is, a journey and an outworking of a calling, the marks of an incredibly existing um, relationship, we could, in many churches, have made the terrible mistake of thinking and believing that Paul was actually declaring that he had arrived, that he was perfect, that he had arrived at spiritual perfection. And this misunderstanding could lead us down a path that would rip the very joy out of our souls and would destroy our church. It is the dark path called perfectionism. And Paul quickly says these words, Have I got all this right? Have I arrived? Not at all. That's what he says in verse 12. I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Paul resolves to live a life of pursuit. He knows the, that he hasn't obtained Christ fully, and so he pursues it with all his might. From the world of, of war and the world of athletics, Paul uses aggressive and violent language here to describe his approach to spiritual growth. Let's look at verse 12 a little closer. He says, but I press on. Now press on means to follow or press hard after, to pursue with earnestness, to pursue with diligence in order to obtain or go after something. And then he says in the ESV version, I pursue to make it my own. And the word to make it my own means to obtain the prize with the idea of eager and strenuous exertion, to grasp and to seize upon. The Old Testament uses these words in Exodus 15, 9, which says the, enemy, uh, says, the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have uh, its full of them. 
So this is sort of like a, a nitty gritty, rough and tumble kind of approach that Paul is describing for himself. And that, that with you know, all my might and with all my strength, I long for, I lust after it, I want to know Christ, and so I pursue with all of my mind. And this is an incredible passage. I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus had made me his own. So just kind of meditate on that wonderful thought, that wonderful truth that Jesus Christ has made me his own. Christ saw after Paul. Christ had arrested his heart and made him a child of God. Paul was a recipient of God's grace. This whole passionate, nitty-gritty, rough-and-tumble pursuit began when Christ seized him on that Damascus road. And now Paul says, because I'm walking in this new relationship and there's this new life, this, this springtime, since winter is over for me and late spring has come, I also want to share that summer is about to dawn. He says in verse 13, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken a hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. He says, look, you know, I'm free. And by the way, this should be a moment for many of us to reflect, reflect on. He says, I am free. I'm not letting my pre-Christian past have power over me. I will openly talk about it, but I will not let the past dominate and have authority in my present. Regret, shame, guilt do not have a place for me, for Jesus took all I should be condemned for, and it has been removed. And he would not just say that my pre-Christian past does not have authority over me. He also would clearly say, I will not rest on what I've done in the springtime. In the name of Jesus, I will not spiritually retire. I will not allow what I did in a different time in my Christian walk to be something I continuously go back to look at, the, at as a golden age, the good old days, when I did that for Jesus. He says, I will not let my pre-Christian past, nor will I let the good things I've done in Jesus' name, actually stop me. I will continue to follow Jesus until he takes me, bringing this idea home. One pastor preached these words to his church. He said, some of the most unhappy people I've ever met or seen or ever known in church or outside of church live their life always looking over their shoulder. What a waste. He writes, nothing back in your past can be changed. I mean, what's in your past? There's only two things, great attainments and accomplishments that could either make you proud by reliving them or indifferent, keyword indifferent by resting on them, or there's failures and defeats that cannot help but arouse feelings of guilt and shame. Now, why in the world would any of us, he preached, go back to that quagmire? I've never been able to figure this one out. He said, by recalling those inglorious, ineffective events of yesterday, our energy is sap for facing today. We're rehearsing those wrongs, now forgiven by Jesus' grace. That derails us and it demoralizes us. There are few joy stealers more insidious than past memories that haunt our mind. And then he preached and Paul would say to us, forget your past. Now, does he mean forget it, like don't ever access it? No, what he means is that it does not have authority over you today. So many of us as, as Christians are not joy-filled Christians because our past is bigger than the God we supposedly worship. And Paul comes and says, I will not let my past have power over me. And remember, this is a man who was at the you know, height of his religious experience and also would have the guilt of murdering Stephen and possibly other Christians on his own hands. And he can still say in confidence, it does not control me. He says, I do not let that happen. In verse 14, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Time and time again, Paul reminds us that God calls us heavenward in Christ. Paul has described the Christian life, his own walk in light of what, uh, what is to come. The average Christian is called to live one's life as a runner. Paul is trying to show us not what the prize always looks like, but actually what the runner looks like. The runner in the end is not distracted by good, bad, great, or evil things. The runner has a full, confident grip on their future. And lastly, the prize, very interestingly, is Jesus. The prize is not heaven or a new earth. The prize is not some mansion. The prize is not even eternal life. The prize for Christians is Jesus. 
Our faith is foundationally relationship-centered, and Paul would remind us that we are running our race, not just to get eternal life or to go to a new heaven or a new earth where God recreates all things to make them right. We run our race because we cannot wait to see Jesus. In verse 15, he says, All of us then who are mature should take a view of such things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. So Paul basically says, everything I've written to you so far, chapter 1, 2, and 3, to this point in the letter, that's what a mature Christian looks like. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, how many decades, how many days or months. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter your gender, your race, your background. The simple declaration Paul would give you this morning is you can actually sit down and evaluate your maturity as a Christian based on what you agree with so far that he's written in Philippians 1, 2, and 3. And if you follow it through in your life, your maturity is based on applying truth. Now, lots of us are older in our faith, but not necessarily mature. And then Paul comes along and says, you know what? The truth is, I've done this for a while. I know some of you are just aren't going to agree with me yet, and I'm good with that. He says some of you are going to be people that are tempted to perfectionism. Some of you are actually being tempted towards that now. And he would say this to his audience is that you, can still, you still think it's your right in a local church to argue and grumble all the time because you think you're right and everyone else is wrong and it's your right to do it. That's fine. He says, all in good time. God's going to have a conversation with you. God bless you. Have a great day. Hugs. I'm out. Paul says, listen, verse 16, let's live up to what we've already attained. Join together in fellowship my, and, and following my example, brothers and sisters, just as you have us as a model. Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. He says, look, I'm a follower after Jesus. I'm not perfect, but use me as a model because I'm working this through. Not at, you know, you know at that moment I thought Paul would maybe kind of stop there, but he doesn't. Suddenly in the passage, things kind of change. Paul feels the great need to address another group who actually could tear the joy right out of the church. Now, during this time, there were a group of false teachers um, that theologians called Judaizers. They were the very, they were, you know, early Jews uh, that taught that Jesus was the Son of God, that they believed Jesus was the Messiah, but they also had started teaching that they had to follow the Jewish law in order to become a Christian. That they, they had to love Jesus, meet Jesus, have a relationship with him, and become fully religious in Jewish laws. And then you could become a Christian. And so it was Jesus plus the law equals Christianity. Well, Paul shot that down right away, and he says it's never Jesus plus anything. It's just Jesus, period. But now he needs to deal with another group because Paul understands the dynamics of people. And he says, look, there's another group among you or possibly could come among you that I understand. They don't need to become deeply religious to know Jesus. They have the opposite problem. They come along and say, I'm in Jesus. I'm saved. I'm loved. I'm free. I can walk in freedom. I've got my fire insurance. You know what I mean? And, and I can do anything I want. I'm free. So I can, you know, live, I can divorce my spiritual walk from how I think, and I can divorce my spiritual walk from how I act. And so he says in verse 18, For as I've told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Now listen to this, please. For, for us who are Christians, when we read verse 18, our instinct is to read this verse and say, that, that's talking about everyone outside of church, enemies of the cross, people who belong to another religion, people who invent their own religion, those who are atheists or agnostic or, or whatever. And, and we fill in the blank. But guess what? Paul comes along and he says, nope, not at all. That's not who I'm talking about. Actually, all the people I'm referring to in this verse are inside the church. These are people that would call themselves Christians. They go to life groups and they come to church, but they don't really know Jesus. Now, this moment could make us a little uncomfortable. Because Paul actually calls people who regularly come to church enemies of the cross. 
And they're not people that they're not people who that had salvation. They think they have salvation and they don't. Now, why is he calling them this? Well, here it is. They are living a life that is in direct opposition, not only to the ethics of the cross, but to the very nature and meaning of the cross. So there's two groups. He's ad addressing the uh, Judaizers and those who, see, who can uh, just live any way they want. And if you trust in what you do, how religious you are, if you trust in anything for salvation but Jesus' work alone in your life, you at this moment are an enemy of the cross. Why? Because you don't actually believe that you need what Jesus did on the cross. You are declaring that, yes, I know Jesus said it's finished, but Jesus, don't you understand? You know, I need to do something too. I need to make sure that I'm in your good books. I need to, you know, we need to kind of work this out together. I need to get involved and you're involved. And Jesus says, enemy. Now to the other group, he comes along and says this, if you think you have embraced the cross of Christ and the work of Jesus in your heart, your life should show that you've embraced him. If you use the cross as a cover to live any life you want, including sitting, then we have a problem. Now we're not, you know, talking about, we're not talking about struggling with sin. OCC is not a legalistic church. It's not saying that we, we don't struggle. Many of us have deep spiritual struggles. Many of us sin all the time. All of us do. Many of us have lots of stuff to unpack in our emotional history. But here's the point. If you've met Jesus, over time your life will become more and more cross-centered. If your life does not change in any way or in very little ways, you have a question to ask about your life because you cannot encounter the living Jesus of heaven and earth and embrace his cross and not become cross-centered. It's impossible. Now notice something else here. It's really important. Paul's not angry here. Paul is crying. He's broken. There's no glee here. Paul is a broken man and he says, I weep over those people. Not out of arrogance, but out of genuine brokenness. And so here's a question for you. Have you ever wept for those who do not know Jesus to meet him? Have you ever been so broken for a moment, even for Christians to be free or to be truly know Christ? If Jesus wept and Paul wept, you know, maybe if you've never wept for the lost, maybe you're broken or maybe there's a little something off. Paul comes and he says, I am broken. And then he takes a moment, though, to outline why he's so broken. He describes what the supposed Christians look like. He says in verse 19, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and, and their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Now, when I read that this week, I said, wow, what in the world is he actually talking about? Is he just saying that they love food a lot? No. See, what was happening is that the Christians were hanging out in the places where they weren't supposed to anymore. They were going to the temples to worship idols, and they were eating feasts right in front of those idols. That, of course, we know Scripture is very clear, and that behind those idols are demons, and that we can't do that. And he says, you know, you glory in shame, which is just sort of an old-school way of saying that you use your body sexually all the time by doing things that I've told you never to do outside of a heterosexual marriage. You cannot do this stuff. My lordship has more significance than your rights. And so he says, you glory in your shame. And he says, look, here's the real description. They have the name of Jesus, but their life is set on earthly things. Writing to another church, he writes what earthly things are in Colossians 3.2. He says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed. Interesting that greed's in there, right? That could be hoarding money or wanting money in the wrong way, which is idolatry. And so because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must... Also, get rid, of, get rid of yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language. Do not lie to each other. He says, as a sort of as a side note here, 
Is this saying that if any of us participate in any of these things that we're not really Christian? No, not at all. If it was, we'd all be done, right? But what Paul is saying here is there is a group of people that claim the name of Jesus and come to church and read their Bibles, but they have no evidence of change, of life change. And he says, you're an enemy of the cross because you do not access the power of the cross. We cannot do anything, right? We feel like as, as Christians, we cannot grab or give in or touch or participate in anything that attracts our fancy or that the world says is just fine. We are not free to sin as Christians. We are free to live in Christ. And by the way, Paul would say our identity, our calling, our job description, our heart, our lives are not bound. Now the way the world works, he says, we are not called to be marked by earthly things. So another question for you, some of you. Are you willing to humble yourself knowing that God is a God of love and declare yourself as an enemy and say, I want to be a friend? I will not trust in myself or my good works. The real issue is many of us are nominal Christians. Christianity is an encounter with the living Jesus. God comes um, God comes to some of you today in love and says that you're actually in winter, but I want to give you spring, and I will give you a moment to kind of deal with that in a second. Now, lots of us this morning are going, hey, great stuff, but that's not me. I've had that conversation. It's genuine, so it's spring in my life. What do I do? Well, I'm going to give you a, a, a few things uh, to, to share with you. Joy is produced in our walk. When we're sure of our calling and our past does not own us, please hear this, joy is produced in an average Christian life. When your calling is sure and your past does not own you, Paul comes in and says, right in chapter 3, verse 10, right? I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I wanted to participate in his sufferings. I want to die like him. I want resurrection. Now we read that and some of us go, I will never be that. And my response to you would be, okay, but do you understand at the core of your being that Jesus Christ has taken a hold of you? That you will have joy, you will run the race, you will suffer, you, you will forgive others, you will live for him. If you live your life out of the understanding that you've really been called, if you do not ground your Christian walk in his calling, you'll always be left with you. And if you're left up to you, you always fail. One of the great foundations we've lost in the church is connecting our joy to his calling on our life, not our work. So if you want joy as you live out in spring, never forget Paul explicitly says every day, get up, declare, I've been called and Jesus Christ has made me his own. He showed up and I'm very thankful. Joy will be found there. Then once you know that you've been called, the second thing kind of goes right away. Paul would declare it, that your past cannot be your master. So many of us do not have joy in our Christian walk because your past is bigger than the God we worship. Your past is bigger than the God you worship. Some of us who are listening to this you know, here we are years later, we're regretting things that we've done in the past, things that we've done to others, or what others have done to us, and we're, we are filled with guilt and shame, and we come and do church every week, and we're faithful, but there's no joy in us. Why? Because we have never come to the point where we actually have applied the forgiveness of Jesus in our life. He's forgiven us, but we haven't forgiven ourselves, or he's forgiven us, but we haven't even forgiven him. Paul comes and says, how desperate are you for joy? How strong do you want spring in your life? He says, then your past sin cannot be your master any longer. Say yes to what Jesus has done over you. And then to another group, he would come and say, oh, some of you have been faithful for so long in Jesus' name, and you have loved Jesus. You've helped lead the church. You've done this in Jesus' name. You've served. You are a leader in the church. And you can, you know, fill in the blank with whatever you have done. Then something's happened to you. Because of life, you've just stopped. And Paul would come and say to you, you may never rest on your past spiritual laurels or experience. 
There is no, those were the good old days when, you know, for our, our Christian faith. If you're resting on what you did in 2005 or 1999 or 1980 or 70 or 60, oh, I used to lead people to Jesus, oh, I used to be a leader in the church, I used to help. Just praise God for that. Who did you do it for? You or Jesus? And if you did it for Jesus, say, Jesus, it was so wonderful to serve you this way. And then the next thing is, how do I serve you today? No matter what it looks like. Some of you are saying, you know what, that's fine, Brent. You can say that. It's easy for you. You're a pastor. You work at the church. You haven't lived my life. Agreed. I haven't. But Jesus knows better than you and me. And so some of you need to just stop living in your good spiritual past and say to Jesus, now what today? And you'll have joy again. And your family and your friends will look at you and go, what happened to you? And you'll go, well, you know what? Jesus showed up again. It's been a long time for some that you're in winter. To some of us, we're in spring. And to all of us, let me end with summer. We're all called to live knowing that summer's coming. Gordon Fee, uh, I'm going to share some words that he wrote, and I want you to hear them. I know they're a little kind of complex, but um, they're needed, I think, to end this. He says, the singular most passionate focus on the future consummation, which is the, the coming of Jesus, which Paul clearly intends as an example, often gets lost in the church for a whole variety of reasons. In a scientific age, it's, it's something of a, an embarrassment to many. In a world come to age, only the oppressed think eschatologically for reasons of weakness, we are told. In an affluent age, who needs it? But Paul's voice should not be muffled so quickly and easily. For a race who, who by their very nature are oriented towards the future, but who have no real future to look forward to, here is a strikingly and powerful Christian moment. The tragedy that attends the, the, the rather thoroughgoing loss of hope in contemporary Western culture is that we, now, that we are now trying to make the present eternal. Hence, North Americans in particular are the most death-denying culture in the history of the race. If he continues, in the midst of such banal hopelessness of believers in Christ, who recognizes Christ as being, as, as the beginning and the end of all things meaningful, needs to be reminded again, and to think in terms of sharing it with the world, that God's purposes for his creation are not finished until he has brought our salvation to its consummation. Indeed, to deny the consummation is to deny what is essential to any meaningful Christian faith. Paul finds uh, life meaningful precisely because he sees the future with great clarity. So many of us are not having meaningful Christian lives because we don't believe Jesus is really coming back, though we believe we don't. Paul says, I know what's coming. How can I not have meaning in this life? He roots his present in the future. He says, summer is coming. Our citizenship is in heaven. Jesus' resurrection is true. We're going to be like him. He calls us to stand firm. We're called to eagerly wait for Jesus. Live and watch for Jesus' return. He says, look. I want you to know Christ. I want you to focus on the goal, run the race, take hold, tell others this is not the end. This is not all that's going to be. Share the good news of life and joy that we are living in the spring. You don't have to be bound in winter. And there is a summer coming that we only somewhat can imagine. But we do know that there'll be no more war, death, suffering, abuse, fill in the blank. Why? Because Jesus is going to restore the world back to what it was. Paul comes and says to our community here at OCC, some of you are in winter, repent and find friendship. He says to all of us that are in spring, root yourself in calling and abandon your past in the right ways, and then ends and says, you must live like Jesus is coming back. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thanks for your love for us. Thanks that you care for us. 
Thank you that you're a father who deeply loves us. Thanks for Paul's life and what you did through him. We're sitting here today because of him. And here's some of our prayers to you, Lord. If you're in winter and you've had the, oh my goodness moment, almost horrific experience, you went, oh, I think I might be an enemy of the very person I thought I knew. I want you to pray this prayer. Sincerely, Jesus, I want to admit right now that I actually am an enemy of yours and I thought I was your friend. Please forgive me. For some of you, you need to pray this. I've worked my whole life to impress you. I've said in my quiet moments, I have to do lots to make sure I'm okay and I'm going to get in. And by doing that, I have actually violated what you did for me and I repent and I want your friendship. I want to truly know Jesus as Savior and Lord and I trust in Jesus, his work and not my own. Help me to do things that are good because I love you and not because I need to earn your love. For others of you, you need to say, Oh, Jesus, forgive me. I've done church for days, months, and years. I've marked your name. I've called myself a Christian in private or public, but I am not one of those Christians. I've lived my life any way I want to. I ask for your forgiveness, and I repent of my sin right now. Forgive me for living a life without Jesus. Forgive me for living a life without the power of the cross. I willingly say to Jesus, Come and be my Savior and my King and my Lord. I embrace what the cross is about. Come and make me a person of love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I repent for living one way and saying something else. I want my words to match. I want to be your friend. For others of you, you need to simply say this because you live in spring. I have been called, Lord Jesus, to live and to serve you. I will faithfully share your hope with those around me. I can have a full and rewarding life that is in service to you for my entire life. And lastly, I pray for myself as a fellow follower and all of us that we would live like Jesus is coming back, not being obsessed with the future, but knowing its right place in our life. We ask and pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we end today, let me remind us to check out the links on the slides at the end of this video. Get connected to one of our life groups. Join us for prayer tonight. God says, behold, I am making everything new. In this new year, let us move forward with the confidence that he gives, with a new song in our hearts and on our lips, with a new way before us, with our eyes fixed on the horizon when Christ will return and make a new heaven and a new earth. May this be the year. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus.